Well, hello and welcome to this new video in which we continue reviewing this book, What We Owe to Each Other by T.M. Scanlon. Uh, this time we are finally going to cover the second chapter of the book. Uh, if you remember, in the last chapter, Scanlon talked about what he means by reasons. He uh, takes them as the primitive or base unit in ethical reflection, and they'll be the starting point uh, for the next uh, chapter, which talks about value. Quote, I will use the notion of a reason taken as the most basic and abstract element of normative thought to provide a general characterization of a slightly more specific normative notion, the idea of value. So, when we say that we have a reason to hold a certain belief or do a certain act, we're basically saying that we hold valuable what we consider as reasons and the things we consider as belief. If I have a belief, then obviously that belief has some value to me, otherwise I wouldn't hold it. And if I do a certain action voluntarily, obviously that action has some value as well. Or at least the reasons behind it must have value. Why would I then do it if it wasn't the case? So, the notion of a reason is indistinguishable from the notion of value. But then things can be valuable for a whole range of reasons. And what Scanlon is concerned with isn't value in general, or all kinds of values, but those involved in what we owe to each other. So, the values about what is right and what is wrong, so we are talking about moral value. So, Scanlon argues that there are what he calls moral value in the, in the narrow sense, which involve questions about justice, equality, fidelity to uh, agreements, etc. But there are also values like loyalty to one's friends and devotion to one's family, as well as such things as industriousness and the avoidance of excessive consumptions. And these are, uh, these, these are values like they are intermediary between moral values in the narrow sense and then the non-moral values uh, such as, you know, the value of works of nature, the excellence in art and music or intellectual or scientific accomplishments. And so this is how we often think of values outside of philosophical circles. Within philosophical circles, the term value is often equated with the good or the right. Like when we deal with theories of value in philosophy, we ask questions like what is goodness or what things can be considered good. And Scanlon writes, the good deals with how we have reason to want the world to be, while the right has to do with what we may or must do. And so sometimes we, uh, we treat the good and the right as distinct, while at other times the right is often reduced to the good. But Scanlon says it's kind of a controversial claim. Uh, what Scanlon is after is to argue that when we focus too much on the good, it can lead to a distortion of the notion of value. Like for Scanlon, what we owe to each other is more the domain of rightness, than goodness and trying to make it so that reasons in the sense of what we owe to each other must be understood in terms of goodness as distinct from rightness that can be misleading uh, we are often using the terms of you know uh, looking for good reasons but in philosophy goodness has a specific meaning that we that we have to understand in order to uh, avoid misleading uh, people when we say that their reasons have to be good. What we should say is that whether we, uh, whenever we utter the word good, uh, what, we, what we mean is right. So when I say good reasons, what I mean is having the right reasons. Uh, and so for reasons to be appropriate, what matters is their rightness, uh, not necessarily their goodness, although these two notions can overlap and they do many, in many cases. And this is because, according to Scanlon, our notion of value outside of philosophy is broader than it is in philosophy. And therefore, values aren't necessarily limited to what the world should, uh, to how the world should, uh, should go, or what is the best for particular people. Um, if our reasons uh, have to be, uh, have to, if our reasons, in order to be valid, uh, they need notions of value in the narrow philosophical sense, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to function. So, Scanlon wants a notion of value that is compatible with how we think about values in, uh, in our common sense, and not 
to come up with a too narrow normative account of what should be considered valuable. Like if, if all of my reasons must be aligned with what Jesus would do, for example, then we'd be falling back on, you know, trying to figure out what is the most rational thing uh, to do. And we already covered its problems in the first, uh, in the first chapter. So we need a broad notion of, uh, of value, and in this broad notion, uh, Skellen says that it is true that we will have a difficult time to distinguish between values of what we owe to each other and other kinds of value, because we'll see that most values proceed uh, from the structure that Skellen is going to, to explore in this, in this chapter, but that's not a problem if other values share the same structure as what we owe to each other, so long as the account is uh, is accurate. Now, the first way to generally look at uh, value, uh, and this would explain why the notion of the good is so prevalent in uh, philosophical dis uh, discussions about value, is because of what we call teleology. Now, a teleological account means that something aims at a certain purpose, a certain aim. Uh, it's from the Greek word uh, telos, which means goal and or purpose. And in the case of ethics, this means that what counts is the promotion of states of affairs that are worth striving for. So these are uh, these states of affairs can be valuable either in themselves, meaning that they are not valuable because they will contribute to achieving something else, like they're not instrumental, but they are states of affairs that we seek for their own, uh, for their own sake. And so since those states of affairs are in themselves valuable, like for example, happiness or well-being or, I don't know, equality, then what we have reasons for must be uh, things that tend towards those state of affairs. So doing things or holding beliefs that will maximize my happiness, and my happiness is a state of affairs that I consider valuable, this gives appeal and weight to the reasons that would promote such state of affairs. As Scanner writes, what we have reason to do on this view, at least as far as questions of value are concerned, is to act so as to realize those state of affairs that are best, that is, have the greatest value. And so this is a formal account rather than a sub, uh, substantive account of value because it states that reasons don't really matter on their own, but only in relation to the state of affairs that they are seeking. Uh, if uh, happiness is the state of affairs that I'm seeking, then studying philosophy won't be valuable on its own uh, if it is not, you know, part of a plan to maximize my happiness. So this is a position taken, for example, by Keegan Shelley, uh, who, is, who is a Yale uh, philosophy professor, who Skellen quotes in a note, and for whom the outcomes of an actions or belief is what matter since they have their, uh, their meaning insofar as they contribute to some sort of higher state of affairs. So we can only promote beliefs and actions if they contribute uh, to a state of affairs that is, of course, deemed the good. And so this is the famous uh, for the greater good argument, but what can uh, this greater good be? For Scanlon teleological accounts are always promoting a state of affairs that is good, uh, if not the good, otherwise there won't, uh, be, any, uh, there won't be any reason to promote it. Um, and so for there to be a uh, such state of affairs, it has to have a universal appeal to it. The idea that often follows teleological thinking is what Scanlon calls universal hedonism. The view that the value of a state of affairs is determined by the amount of pleasure that it contains. So if I'm going to promote a state of affairs, one that produces the highest amount of pleasure for the most people is certainly one that is difficult to object to on reasonable grounds. And so this appeal comes with three other ideas. Quote, the first uh, first, since uh, on this view, uh, actions themselves have no intrinsic value, the value of an action is determined by the value of its consequences, that is to say, by the amount of pleasure it leads to. Second, according to universalistic hedonism, this value is impartial, not only in the sense that everyone's pleasure is taken into account, but also in the sense, important for our current discussion, that the value of a state of affairs gives every agent the same reason to promote it. Third, 
According to hedonism, this value is additive. Any theological conception of value involves maximization in a weak sense of holding that we have more reason to promote those states of affairs that have greater value. So, uh, the three points of universal hedonism is that the value of an action is determined by their consequences, uh, we call this consequentialism, universal hedonism is impartial, and lastly it is additive, meaning that its appeal comes from adding up the amounts of pleasure uh, to see if that state of affairs outweighs suffering or pain, or adds the sums of values that contribute to the final state of affairs. Now, of course, these three ideas aren't dependent on each other, like consequentialism doesn't have to be impartial or additive, and likewise, impartiality doesn't have to be uh, based on consequentialism or additive notions, and additive notions uh, of value don't have to be consequentialist or impartial. Um, and so, uh, these ideas don't have to always be present in all teleological accounts. Some can, for example, be partial, like the example I chose about, you know, my own happiness. Others don't have to be additive and others don't have to reject, uh, don't have to reject, you know, intrinsic, uh, intrinsic values. Uh, like teleological accounts don't necessarily rule out the fact that notions, uh, that actions, sorry, that actions or beliefs can be good in their own right. Uh, we can say, for example, that an action contributed to the greater good because that action was good in and of itself. Like consequentialism doesn't rule out that fact uh, that to have good consequences you must have good actions or beliefs. Uh, whether it is the case or not, it doesn't really matter. We're just saying that it doesn't rule out that possibility. So on this account, one can say that if an action didn't produce uh, a good result, then the action itself was bad. So the tele uh, teleological account is pretty simple. What distinguishes between the, the different views of uh, teleology isn't, you know, the three ideas we listed, but rather only states of affairs that have value. So, actions are good in themselves if they are components of states of affairs, as Kanan says, and so this means that we take actions as a state of affairs too, uh, too uh, as something, you know, that, that occurs, or occurred, or will uh, occur, and if that occurrence is good or not. So, like happiness, for example, which is a state of affair, but also uh, studying philosophy or donating to charity. Although these are actions, they are also states of affairs. And so the question is whether or not to promote them. If they are good states of affairs, then the answer is yes. So Skellen isn't concerned with showing, uh, with showing that just because some accounts don't have these three ideas together, then they're not teleological, because for Skellen, what makes an, ac uh, an account teleological isn't really those three ideas. But then someone can ask, well, if it's not consequentialism, if it's not impartiality, and if it's not additivity, then what is left for a claim to be teleological? Because Scanlon doesn't say that a tele teleological claim needs to have at least one of those ideas either. He's saying that teleological claims are based on something else entirely. And it is this something that distinguishes between teleological claims and non-teleological claims. So, to understand what this something is, we need to look at a controversy between consequentialism and deontology. Deontology is what opposes consequentialism, arguing that we do things not for the consequences, but because these things are in themselves good, no matter what the consequences uh, can be. So a deontologist may be opposed to a certain act, even if that act would, be, uh, would have better consequences. Like, you know, lying is always bad, no matter what the outcome would be. This is often taken as a way to uh, ridicule Kant's position, since he is the deontologist par, uh, par excellence. Like, what if you are hiding Jews and a Nazi officer uh, asks you if you are hiding Jews? If you are a Kantian, then you'd have to tell the truth. But in other cases, it would mean that you cannot torture someone just so that person uh, gives, you know, information about a potential terrorist attack. But here, we're not uh, criticizing the ontology, we're just saying that both consequentialism and the ontology are teleological. Both of these theses want to promote the good, or the best states of affairs. They, are, uh, they just disagree on what can count uh, to promote it. 
So one says that it's the consequences and the other says it's the nature of the actions. So Thomas Nigel, for example, who is a 100% deontologist, argues that things are either good or bad, not because of their outcomes or consequences, but because they are objectively and impartially good or bad. So deontology also can have both the intrinsic value of actions, but because actions are intrinsically good, therefore they impose themselves on us, whether we like it or not. So they are objective and impartial. So for example, releasing uh, someone from pain is intrinsically good and it is something that applies universally and impartially. Like it doesn't matter if you don't like it uh, or you don't, I mean, for example, you don't like that person or you want to get revenge, relieving someone from pain is always good full stop. So relieving pain is to be promoted, causing pain is to be prohibited. But then we are, we are facing a challenge. Um, now, Skellen doesn't address the common challenge of when you are in front of a situation in which all options are bad from a deontological perspective. Like a case, uh, a case is mentioned, but not to illustrate this particular challenge. Uh, like in the case of torture, Nigel argues that you cannot torture someone even though torturing him will lead you to prevent an even bigger crime. Uh, the challenge here is clearly you either torture someone or you let people die. And you can uh, try to find, you know, the the bomb yourself or tell people to stay home or not you know gather but when you can't you cannot find the bomb or people will not listen to you then you either torture tor torture that uh, you know the, the person who knows where the bomb is or you let people die so both are violation of uh, deontological principles and there is no way out and so you are going to have to choose the lesser uh, evil uh, evil option um, but the, the challenge that Nigel and Scanlon refer to, that uh, the ontologists have to answer, isn't what to do in cases where all options available violate the ontology, but rather on what grounds, other than the consequence of an action, can anyone assess the wrongness of that action? If I say stealing is wrong, I have a reason not to steal, right? But I also have reason to prevent stealing from happening. I have reason to prevent someone to prevent someone else to steal. But then, if I say that the action is wrong and therefore I have to prevent it, I am also saying that the happening of the action is wrong, that the occurrence of the action is wrong. Being opposed to stealing means that I'm also opposed to the happening of stealing. But if I'm opposed to the happening of stealing, then what is bad is what happens in that action, which means it's consequences. So any action judged bad or wrong can only be judged on the grounds of its happening and therefore its consequences. And so here Nigel, uh, Nigel asks, how, he asks, can there be a reason not to twist someone's arm, which is not equally a reason to prevent his arm from being twisted by someone else? Or as Scanlon frames it, how can there be a reason not to bring something about which is not grounded in the badness of its happening and hence equally a reason to prevent it from being brought about by some other agent or by the forces of nature? So deontological arguments uh, have to also be consequentialist, otherwise they would contradict themselves. If they argue that we oppose an action on the grounds of its happening, then they cannot say uh, we uh, we, pre uh, we uh, then they cannot say we prevent others or other forces of nature to carry that action. If a deontological position holds that an action is wrong in itself, regardless of its outcomes, then it becomes puzzling to explain why there is a reason not to perform that action since the wrongness isn't in the act being performed or its consequences. How else, how else are you going to explain that wrongness? And so consequentialism seems to have the upper hand. You know, I mean, Scanlon mentions uh, Samuel uh, Schaeff, uh, Scheffler and, uh, and in two footnotes, another philosopher, Philippe Petit, uh, who argue that consequentialism has the benefit of being about maximizing rationality, uh, meaning that it always looks for the most rational option available, and that is determined by the undesirability 
or the de desirability of certain goals. If a goal isn't desirable, then I shouldn't do uh, things that promote it. So I have to be rational in the sense of choosing actions that reduce as much, uh, as, much as possible the possibility of that goal from happening. If it is a desirable goal, then I must choose the best actions to realize that goal. And so according to Petit, this also has the advantage of being analogous to non-moral areas, since the same method can be applied to things that are not involved with uh, morality. So the fact that consequentialism is rooted in rationality, in the sense of, uh, you know, the desirability of goals and finds analogs in other domains gives it more credibility than perhaps deontology. And if deontology, deontology can claim that it too thinks some actions as undesirable, which is the case like torture or murder, then it's no longer deontological but consequentialist since they'll, they'll have no other way to argue for why to prevent those actions uh, in a different way, uh, the, in a different way from a uh, consequentialist, right? If a deontologist maintains that we shouldn't torture, even when torturing will lead to a better outcome, then they're violating the principle of maximizing rationality. And as a result, they make it, uh, they make it that a worse crime than torture becomes desirable, which is absurd. Or if not absurd, both uh, would uh, become impartially equal. So judging the wrongness of an action in itself rather than the outcome runs the risk of making everything in terms of badness equal like torturing one person who has placed a bomb somewhere that would kill thousands of people becomes equal to bombing thousands of people. And so this leads to a situation of absurd impartiality. Um, another example of this absurd impartiality is given by Schiffler himself when he suggests that when we look at a murder and an accidental death, because of the impartiality of deontological philosophers, if you find yourself in a situation where you have on the one hand a murder and on the other you have an accidental death, even if you, uh, even if you know that you have better chances at providing, uh, at preventing, sorry, at preventing the uh, accidental death, you, uh, while well, you know that you have almost zero chances of pre preventing the murder, then you have to try to prevent the murder and not the, ac uh, and not the accidental death, no matter what. And so this becomes quite weird and strange to argue for. Like what kind of spe special impartial intrinsic disvalue can there be in murder that would make it okay to prevent a murder and not an accidental death when uh, you are faced, you know, with both situation uh, even if you have zero chances of stopping the murder, but almost 100% chance of stopping the accident. So what uh, Scheffler uh, suggests is that this value cannot be impartial like this. It must be agent relative. It is defined as, this is this value of a kind that gives the agent of such, situ of such an action a special reason not to perform it, a reason that does not apply in the same way to others, such as, for example, those who might be in a position to prevent the action. So, what this means is that to assess the value or this value of an action or belief, you cannot be impartial but must take into account what is relative to the agent performing or being involved with, uh, with the action. Uh, the, you also need to take account the evalu that the evaluation of an action uh, must, take into, uh, must take into account the specific position, perspective or role of the agent involved. And so, it recognizes that individuals often have particular duties, obligations, or reasons that are linked to their own agency. Like when you have to choose between saving your own child or a stranger, well, impartially speaking, uh, whomever you are going to save mustn't be safe out of your partial inclination towards one of them. And so Scheffler argues that in that situation, well, it is impossible to be impartial. Clearly, you are going to save your child. Now, of course, consequentialism can also miss on agent relative uh, disvalue or value when, for example, it wants to maximize the happiness of everyone regardless of our personal positions or relations to those people. But the point here is that neither consequentialism nor deontology 
can be impartial, although deontology seems to be the one, uh, the one mostly in difficulty here. Now, the reason why we addressed this issue regarding consequentialism and deontology is because, as we said, what distinguishes teleological from non-teleological uh, views of value isn't that teleological views are consequ consequentialists or that they think that actions have no intrinsic value or that they are impartial or that they are additive. Instead, what makes them teleological, whether these views are consequentialists or deontologists, uh, is that they take desirability of events as what constitutes the importance of weight uh, that we ought to give to values. Now, uh, like maximizing rationality means recognizing that some events are desirable and we want those events to occur or not to occur if they are undesirable. And so desirability of events is like the compass that allows you to, uh, to know what you have to value. So what constitutes the core of teleological views is the desirability of events. And so while Scanlon argues that this, uh, that this uh, mode of selection applies in many cases, it cannot account for all cases that involve value, even moral value. Quote, it is certainly true that in many cases in which we are faced with a choice between bringing about one consequence and bringing about another, the right way to decide is by determining which of these outcomes is more desirable. But from the fact that, they, that this is often the case, it does not follow that it is always, always so, or even that when it is so, all the reasons bearing on the choice can be cast in the form of its being good or bad that events of a certain kind should occur. So, two things here. He says that not all values are justified on the grounds of whether an event is desirable or not. And second, even if it is the case, like even if desirability determines which outcome is better, desirability still fails in providing good or right reasons for either promoting or not promoting an event. Like that, uh, like that an event is desirable doesn't mean that I have reasons to promote it. This, of course, is related to the critiques Kennan offered against desires in the first chapter, and he, uh, and he reminds us uh, of that here too. Quote, many of the reasons bearing of an, uh, on an action concern not the desirability of outcomes, but rather the eligibility or ineligibility of various other reasons. So, when one has reasons to do something, it is not because the outcome is desirable, but because those reasons permit, uh, permit us to do that thing since they cannot be rejected on reasonable grounds. So saying, for example, that torture is bad uh, because it is undesirable, or that maximizing pleasure is desirable, whether for some uh, people or for everyone doesn't, uh, doesn't really matter. What matters is that none of this amounts to a reason to prevent torture or to promote maximizing pleasure. The only way for desirability to determine whether we should uh, go for option A or option B, like if desirability becomes sufficient as a reason, then we have to give reasons for why desirability is enough to determine which option is to be promoted over the other. And so, focusing on reasons instead of desirability has the benefit of not equating a reason to do something with the disvalue or the value of that thing. So this means that an action or belief can still hold uh, to its intrinsic value if it has, I mean, if it has a, uh, an intrinsic value at all, even though the agents don't have reason to perform the said uh, action. As Cannon says, judging that a certain consideration does not count as a reason for action is not equivalent to assigning negative intrinsic value to the occurrence of actions based on this reason. So, um, take deontological principles, for example, which base their decision taking on the desirability of outcomes. If one has the deontological principle that you cannot kill one person to save many, this deontologist doesn't argue that saving the lives of the many is disvalued compared to saying, saving just, uh, just one. Rather, he accepts a worldview in which the positive value of the lives of the many doesn't amount to a reason to kill the, uh, the one person. 
uh, whatever reasons he can provide for thinking this way, doesn't matter here. Um, the point is that this deontological principle isn't about the desir desirability of an outcome, but reasons of whether or not the positive value of something actually outweighs or uh, not, uh, or doesn't, the value of something else. So if the principle proves itself to be true, then the deontologist has reasons not to kill one person and so dooms the, uh, dooms the, uh, the others. Even if one argues that what is good here is to save as many lives as possible, the deontologist isn't opposed to the good. He can argue that saving as many lives as possible is the good, but he fails to see that as a reason to adopt it. Just because it's good doesn't amount to, a, to being a reason to do it, right? So again, it doesn't mean that the, de that the deontologist is right, but that he may be, and so we need first to see, you know, what reasons he, uh, he has and whether we can reject those reasons or not. And so the point is to show that once we have reasons and our reasons are correct, we don't need to appeal to the desirability of events or outcomes or even as Cannon says, someone who accepts this principle therefore does not need to appeal to the negative intrinsic value of killing in order to explain why she does not, uh, she does not do what is necessary to save the greater number. And so this word, accept, is very key here, because as Kellen points out, what counts as rational criticism can only apply if one accepts the principle they are operating on. This is a conditional or a hypo hypothetical imperative. If you accept, if you accept, it is only when one accepts a principle that they can be hold, uh, held accountable for it because only then they can provide reasons for why accepting it. And so this means that teleological views always skip a step. Uh, since a teleological view takes desirability as the prime reason-giving force, they fail to give their reasons for why to think that desirability is relevant to produce a reason. In other words, teleological views take it for granted that for desirability to become a reason, teleological principles need first to be accepted. So, Skellen argues that obviously that first step was skipped, because if it wasn't skipped, then teleological views wouldn't dominate axiological fields, since many would see that desirability on its own isn't sufficient to form reasons. Hence, Skellen says that even though Scheffler talks about a fundamental and familiar notion of rationality, he doesn't appeal to teleological notions of value, as he says, if one accepts the, des the desirability of a certain goal being achieved, and if one has a choice between two options, one of which is certain to accomplish the goal better than uh, the other, then it is ceteris paribus rational to choose the former over the latter. So, Scheffler too acknowledges that one has to accept the desirability of certain goal before doing anything. So one must have reasons to take desirability as relevant in forming their intentions of achieving that goal. Once that goal is adopted, meaning that we accepted its desirability, then and only then we can have reasons to prefer the action that promote that goal. So, as Cannon says, what makes Scheffler's account correct is that it does not claim that all the considerations that figure in determining the eligibility of an action have to take the form of goals and their desirability. So, what makes a consideration a reason that is legit have nothing to do with uh, its desirability. And this is further highlighted by the clause ceteris peribus. Uh, paribus, uh, which in Latin means all the rest. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, ceteris is identical paribus. Okay, so it means that all the rest, uh, uh, all the rest is is identical, like all other things being equal. Okay, so it is used to signal that you considered many factors but decided to put them away in order to focus on just a few factors. Like you know that you cannot take every consideration as a reason, so you have to be selective. But that selection has to be appropriate, meaning that you took the time to examine all the other considerations available to you in order to judge whether or not they should be included in your reasons. 
So in our case, this would translate as setting something as a goal means you assert that it, it has a positive value and all things being equal, you take that value as an account in favor of actions that would realize that goal. So here, all things being equal means unless the action conflicts with the achievement of some other goal whose value outweighs this one. So if, uh, for example, if the action that is um, that is working in the re in the realization of my goal clashes with another goal that outweighs the former goal, then I have reason not to do or continue that action. Like here's an example. Suppose that uh, someone hurt you, like someone hurt you really bad, and you want to retaliate. You consider retaliation. You see that it is something with a positive value, and so now you have a goal retaliation. So that goal becomes a reason for you to act in a way to achieve that goal. You, uh, you act, uh, I mean, the, the action to, uh, achieve, uh, to achieve is to hurt the person who hurt you. But then, suppose you are a devoted Christian pacifist that believes that, you know, ven vengeance is a serious sin. You obviously have another goal here, which is, I mean, either uh, getting to heaven or living up to your ethical uh, standards of a Christian pacifist. Now, clearly, the act of vengeance clashes with this goal, that, and this goal you consider more important than the goal of retaliation. So, ceteris paribus means that you can retaliate unless that would compromise your Christian pacifism. This, however, isn't correct uh, since it still relies on the notion of desirability. The reason why the Christian pacifist doesn't retaliate is because he considers his ethical standards more desirable than the brief uh, moment of retaliation. So, Scanlon doesn't reject the ceteris paribus principle, but only asserts that it doesn't make sense to use it in the context of desirability of outcomes. Why? Well, because the ways we adopt goals actually doesn't have much to do with the desirability of those goals. Like, we're not thinking that the reasons we should limit certain goals is because they are overridden by others that have more weight. Rather, as Scanlon says, when we adopt a goal, that goal becomes to play a central part in our life in the sense that it will become a compass for us to know, you know, which, uh, to know which reasons we have to, do, uh, we have to do certain things and how to do them. Quoted, so the limitations indicated by the qualification that other things must be equal include conditions determined by our understanding of the goal and the way in which it is a goal for us, not just limitations imposed by other values that might override, uh, override it. So in other words, it is not that the goal of being a Christian pacifist is more desirable than the goal of retaliation, but rather I have a certain understanding of that goal, which makes that uh, goal relevant for me, and that understanding also shapes the conditions in which I act out on that goal. So this means that it is not that being a Christian pacifist overrides, uh, overrides retaliation, but the way that I understand being a Christian pacifist doesn't give me reasons to retaliate. Um, if someone has another understanding of, you know, Christian pacifism and that understanding can, uh, can back up or is relevant to retaliation, then that person can retaliate while being a Christian pacifist. Of course, we can find that, uh, such, uh, that such behavior is weird and we can ask for the reasons why he thinks that Christian pacifism is reconcilable with, reta with retaliation, but just in case where he can provide that reason, then it is legit. So, ceteris uh, uh, paribus, in Scanlon's sense, isn't limitations due to, desir to desirability, but to what can, uh, can you or what you can't uh, provide reasons for. So, in this sense, the limitations of your goals aren't their competing desirability, but other people since they will be the, the determinant factor of your reasons to promote or not to promote those goals. You know, since you have to justify your reasons to other people. So, one can still see this as a teleological account, because although it's limits, uh, it's, uh, it limits considerations to, uh, to morality, to just the notion of right or wrong instead of non-moral values like, you know, the good, one can still say that Promoting a state of affairs in which people realize this view of what we owe to, uh, to uh, of what each person owes to others, 
this is a desirable state of affairs towards which we should tend. And so in this sense, what we owe to each other becomes the good, even though it is limited to morality, since we've argued that the good goes beyond morality. And so it has the impartial principles of the the teleological views. And Scanlon is aware of this. He says, on this view, it is at least part of what we owe to each other that we must promote certain states of affairs, plausibly called the good. The impartiality of the good that is to be promoted reflects a moral requirement. We owe equal concern to each individual. So Scanlon calls this a moral teleology, which is narrower than the non-moral teleology that is concerned that is uh, that he's concerned with uh, or is concerned with the good in general. But moral teleology simply equates its domain with uh, with the good. So this means that what we owe to each other becomes not specific to each individual, but to all individuals in general. To quote Scanlon, insofar as we are concerned with what is good generally, for good from the point of view of the universe, as Sidwick says, we have just as strong a reason to promote one's personal well-being as to promote another's. And so this is an expression that Scanlon, uh, Scanlon uses, and he borrows it from Henry uh, Sedgwick, uh, from the point of view of the universe. Like Henry Sedgwick uh, meant that uh, the good is to be grasped from the point of view of the universe instead of each particular individual. Like we constantly think about uh, what we ought to do, but not everything that, uh, that we want is the right thing to do. So Sidwick, uh, who was a 19th century utilitarian philosopher, he argued that we can achieve objective and impartial morality about what we ought to do if we look, uh, if we look at morality from the point of view of the universe. Like for Sedwick, one has, one has to do the good not based on, uh, on desires or preferences, because in doing so, well, people won't do anything good, since the good, for example, requires that you help others and assist them in their welfare. Uh, this has to be done whether you like it or not, whether you have preferences or desires or, or don't. Um, so it doesn't make sense to prefer helping someone based on their social class or gender or ethnic origins, like you have to help everyone uh, equally, you have to treat everyone fairly and equally. So, such state of affairs will remain teleological because, as Scanlon points uh, about the reasons that we have to help or assist others, these reasons being provided by the good that is involved rather than by any idea of what is owed morally to the individuals in question. So here we end up with some sort of hybrid model of, uh, of, te of the te teleological view, uh, one that is both moral and non-moral, one that is concerned with both the good in a general sense and with what we owe to, uh, to each other. And so here Scanlon returns to Nigel to highlight this uh, even more, arguing that on the one hand, for example, Nigel uh, bases his argument on an impartial view that is, uh, uh, that is like of, of Sedwick, so treat everyone equally, for example, but on the other hand, he claims that we cannot commit to everyone's desires or and, uh, and preferences. Like, in other words, the universe's standpoint simply, uh, simply becomes relevant when it is about relieving pain, but not when it's about promoting pleasure. As Nigel says, it seems too much to allow an individual's desires to confer impersonal, uh, impersonal values on uh, something outside himself, even if he is, to some extent, involved in it. So, by saying that it is too much, Nigel means that although everyone must promote the good in the sense uh, of uh, Sedwick, we can't also ask for people to promote everything that each individual would consider valuable. Quote again, while we can be asked to recognize moral reasons uh, to prevent and help alleviate each other's pain, it is too much to ask that we seek to advance every end that another person has. So uh, this is the domain of right and wrong, uh, the domain of morality, the domain of what in the, in the sense of which things uh, do we owe to, uh, to each other. And so now Scanlon doesn't object to a moral teleology because his critique is not that there can be no tele teleology 
for morality or for value in general, but that the good can only be understood in terms of teleology, like in terms of being promoted. Like this is what Skellern is trying to argue against. Because as he says, when we consider the particular things that most philosophers have cited as instances of the good, it becomes quite implausible to hold that all our thinking about value can be cast in this, uh, in this form. So, let's take a look at a few examples that philosophers consider instances of the good. Um, Scanlon cites certain states of consciousness, personal relationships, intellectual, art, artistic or moral excellence, knowledge, and human life itself. These things are considered valuable in themselves, which philosophers take, take it to mean that it is good that they occur. So philosophers who think this explicitly are G. E. Moore and, uh, R. W. and W. D. Ross. Um, they both argue that we can uh, that we can know something to be valuable if we imagine a world in which that thing doesn't exist. And so when we clearly prefer our world than that one, then the thing is valuable. And so we want it to occur to be part of our world. So Moore and Ross argue that you know for. Uh, um, uh, argue for the value of things by comparing different worlds. Which world do you want to live in? Which one do you? Uh, which one in which the thing uh, occurs, or the one in which the thing doesn't? And so, if you take the uh, the world in which the thing occurs, then the thing is va has value. Sorry. And so, this is. Uh, but this is where Skellen disagrees, as he thinks that. We cannot reduce the value of something to just whether or not it is good for it to occur, like which states of the universe are better than uh, than, uh, than others. One of the uh, examples that Skellen takes to prove his point is friendship. Now for G.E. Moore, um, he takes friendship to be one of the best things in human life, meaning that for Moore, a world without friendship is worse than a world with friendship. Now, while we can agree with that, uh, with that statement, uh, Skellen thinks that it's not enough to provide reasons for me to hold on to friendship or to consider friendship valuable to the extent that we, uh, that we need here. So Skellen argues that we can think of three reasons to have, that, we, uh, that we would want to have friends. First, uh, it's about doing things that come with being a good friend, like uh, being loyal to your friends, be invested in their um, interests, spend time with them, etc. Second, friendship needs to be maintained through time. And third, since friendship is good for me, it must also be good for others. And so I promote it so that others can, I mean, they can, they can too develop uh, friendships uh, as well. And so these three reasons can be thought of, uh, can be th thought of stating uh, Moore and Ross's claim about increasing the value of the state of the universe, but Skellen argues that it is fallacious to think that way. These reasons that are listed by Skellen don't have uh, this teleological form like accepting them as reasons involves holding that it is good, in this case good for the individuals in question, that friendship should occur and that friendship is therefore to be, uh, to be promoted. Um, in the case of being loyal to uh, my friends, it is not about you know the necessity of loyalty in order for uh, it's not about the necessity of loyalty in order for the friendship to continue. Like I can be loyal to my friend not because I want the friendship to continue, but because I value loyalty, for example, or because I want my friends to be happy, uh, not because I want the friendship to continue. So when I buy a gift uh, to my friend, it is not it is not so that you know the relationship continues. So the reasons that for, for this is what Skellen calls the paradox of teleology, which is similar to Sidwick's paradox of hedonism. Like Sidwick argues that when one wants pleasure, like you know, pleasure is the goal, in order to provide reasons for why pleasure should be the goal, one has to provide reasons that do not involve pleasure. Like you cannot promote aims that seek pleasure directly, but you must do so through aims that don't take pleasure as their central uh, as their central uh, reason. So, uh, and such is the case for teleology too. As Scanlon writes, the fact that it is good that friendship should occur, but that in order for it to occur, people have to be moved by reasons other than the reasons for of promoting the occurrence of friendship, is an instance of what might be called a paradox of teleology. 
So in other words, what makes friendship valuable isn't that you have the goal of maintaining it, but rather those reasons in the first category, like the things that come with friendship, like loyalty and spending time with your friends. If, uh, if we argue through a teleological point of view that friendship occurring is good, then it would seem reasonable to say that someone who betrays his friends values friendship if that betrayal would allow him to make more friends or promote friendship for others. And so, hence, there is a uh, shift in the way we approach uh, friendship. A teleological approach would ask what is for friendship to be uh, valued and once friendship is deemed valuable well it opens up the door for all kinds of thinking we just you know uh, show to be paradoxical so instead Skellen asks another question what is involved in valuing friendship so in other words we ask ourselves what comes with friendship and then when one values friendship, obviously they have to value what comes with it. We have to ask, uh, we have to ask of uh, what good reasons uh, we, uh, what good reasons are there to value those things. As in, is it good? Is it a good thing that we let those? things occupy such an important place in our lives. Like, do I have a good reasons for valuing loyalty? And should I let loyalty be so important in my decision making? So uh, think of a fan, for example. For someone to value fanship, we expect that they would uh, behave a certain way, right? Like, um, in that way involves what comes with fanship. If you are a fan of a movie star or of a singer, then you value watching or listening to their work. You value following their latest updates, seeing them in, uh, in, per in person, etc. Now, to determine whether or not fanship is valuable, we ask if the reasons we have for valuing what comes with fanship are actually, you know, good. In Scannon's word, uh, to hold that fanship or friendship is valuable is to hold that the reasons involved in valuing it are good ones and that it is therefore appropriate to give this notion an important place in shaping one's, uh, one's life. So we don't need our reasons to be teleological, we don't need friendship to be something uh, to be promoted or we don't need to make the case that without friendship our universe would be worse. Most of our reasons to value friendship are more about valuing what comes with friendship. We just need to determine if our reasons are good or, uh, or, they're, or, or they're not, and that would depend on the individual and their particularities, their histories, etc. So in short, they are agent relative and not impartial or teleolo uh, teleological, they, and they don't need uh, and they don't need to be in order to be good reasons. And so the same applies for family ties and even to different types of inquiries. Even when we value philosophy, history, or even science, we have agent relative reasons. We are valuing what comes with family, with philosophy and science, and we just have to provide evidence that the reasons we have for valuing those things are good reasons. In the case of scientific inquiry, for example, we can say that most reasons to value it are teleological, like we can value science when we want to pursue a career in it and devote our life to scientific inquiry, and by seeking a career in science, we hold that these people would exhibit some behavior, like being fair and respecting uh, the uh, scientific method and the research uh, of their peer, otherwise they won't be really valuing science if they fail at these, at these things. We can also say that uh, even for the people who are not interested in having careers in scientific fields, still uh, they still value science and so they would support it and fund it with their taxes. If science is valuable, then we have reasons to study it even though we won't be very knowledgeable in science. Like we accept that science has to be valued and play a role in our lives even though it is not our central interest. I may not know much about physics, for example, but I consider physics to be valuable and so I admire it even though I don't understand it. All of these reasons can look teleological since they are promoting a state of affairs that is beneficial for the world, right? Like a world with science is to be promoted compared to one without science. And when you see how beneficial science is and uh, and uh, and how beneficial it 
it uh, it is for uh, for the world it may seem difficult to think that um, it may seem difficult to think of other reasons uh, that are not teleological for valuing science whenever we admire or promote science is through the idea of contribution like someone's name would be remembered if they contributed if they increase the value of the state of affairs that is science because it produces valuable result but this is what Scanlon disagrees with. He argues that this is not why science is valuable. He starts by questioning what is required for science to be valuable on theological grounds. He, uh, and he finds two things that, uh, that, this, uh, that this is based on. First, it has to make our lives easier and better. And second, it must be exciting, challenging and absorbing. So we have the idea of uh, the idea of it uh, of it is worthwhile because it makes lives better and it is worthwhile because uh, because it is worthwhile like intrinsically intrinsically it is to be valuable so we have a theological account of the value of science which is described as the following in uh, by Scanlon uh, the distinctive instinct value of science must derive on a purely theological account from the fact that states of affairs in which science, scientific knowledge has been attained, and perhaps also ones in which scientific inquiry is engaged in the right way, are better states of affairs and therefore to be promoted. But the problem that Scanlon raises isn't that this is mistaken. After all, science isn't just about the scientists, but also about patrons and the benefactors who certainly would look at science to be about promoting better states of affairs. Thinking in those terms can also account as a good reason and not a mistaken one, but they are not central to the value of science. What Scanlon says is that it is implausible that this is what makes science value, uh, valuable. He's saying that when, when we value science, we're not trying to, per, to persuade that the world would be better in order to value science, you know? Uh, he writes that it is impossible that we should understand all the reasons we have to engage in, support and study science by first identifying some class of ways that it would be better for the world to be, and then explaining these reasons by considering how the activities they count in favor of help uh, to make the world be uh, to make the world be like this So if we act in this way we'd be saying that there are outcomes with an independent value that should serve as the basis for Developing our reasons like we can only have good reasons for valuing science if science has independent values in other words from those independent values our reasons cannot, uh, cannot flow because, well, this would bring us back to the human problem. You cannot derive an ought from an is, and even if that is, is value. If, uh, it, can be, sorry, it can be true in states of affairs involving pain, but it cannot be true of all states of affairs. Instead, Scanlon argues that we cannot wait until we first discover that science has an independent value before we value it. So he proposes an, alter an alternative view to this. We can instead say that we first have good reasons to be curious about the world and try to understand how it works. And since science is the best available tool for that, I come to value science and study science. Likewise, when we admire science and promote it because it produces human excellence in terms of skills and attitude, what we have good reasons to value in terms of excellence isn't that, but that science is the best tool that we have for inquiry into its relevant uh, subject. Again, you can, uh, you can have those reasons you want to promote science because it produces excellent humans but like we said earlier teleological accounts rely on non -tele teleological ones and hence the paradox again so like friendship uh, science has things that come with it a whole social dimension like respect of others research being transparent about findings being neutral etc this social aspect highlights that uh, there are norms to be respected within the scientific community which are reasons for valuing science we don't just value science because it is good that a science, uh, science community exists we value it for what comes with it as Scanlon writes, what I am suggesting, suggesting 
is that if we want to understand why scientific inquiry is worth engaging in and its result worth studying, we do better to consider why the questions it addresses are important and why it offers an, app an appropriate way of trying to answer them than to focus on any particular result that scientific investigation or the study of science might produce. So we can from this arrive, and we probably do, to the same outcomes we find in teleological claims. But here Scannon says, we each correctly regard the achievement of these goals as good, even intrinsically good, but this is a conclusion from the claims about reasons I have mentioned, not their source. So in short, the claims about intrinsic good and states of affairs uh, to be promoted, like teleological claims, are not the source of my reasons, but their conclusion. What constitutes the source of my reasons about scientific inquiry is the appropriateness and reasonableness of such inquiry, which can be backed up with the merits and success of science. From there, I develop further reasons to incorporate scientific inquiry into my life and give it some space, which, also, uh, which will also be based on reasons for why it occupies this much space, and hence scientific inquiry becomes a goal. As Scannon concludes his examples, from the fact that deciding how to pursue one's goals plays uh, an important part in practical thinking, we should not conclude that goals are where all explanations of value must begin. So, we have seen that goals cannot be the beginning of value, and therefore Scannon proposes another meaning for value as opposed to taking something to be a goal or to be promoted. Instead, he says, to value something is to take oneself to have reasons for holding certain positive attitudes toward it and for acting in certain ways in regard to it. Because, uh, because we're different from each other, like each one of us has different circumstances, we come to have different reasons about valuing different things in different contexts. This means that what we value in one context can be right, but can be wrong in another. It can be right to value truth in science, but, but wrong when Nazis ask you if you are hiding Jews. But despite these differences, there is a common core to those, uh, to those reasons, which is, as Scannon says, admiring and respecting the things we value. Respecting and admiring also depends on people and their circumstances and the thing that they admire or respect. But the point is, people value things in the same way. We all value things in the same way, even though that way is expressed differently. And so the point is that we come to understand that when I say that something is valuable, I mean that I can understand that other people also have reasons to value, and so do I. So this doesn't mean that when I value something, then others must value it, but the fact that I know that I value something means that others can value it as well, which means that when I don't value something that others value, I also know that I can have reasons to value that thing too. So when Scannon writes uh, va valuable, he puts it like this, with an emphasis on the able, you know, to suggest that something has to be, uh, has, the, has the potential to, uh, to be of value once we consider reasons for it. Now, does this mean that anything can be valuable or that anything that we value is actually valuable? Well, clearly not, since people can value things that are not valuable. Scannon gives the example of children, saying that it is natural for anyone to say that they, are, that they value their children over others, but it doesn't mean that their children are more valuable than others, right? Like human beings are valuable, but you are, but we are using valuable in a very broad meaning here. Like my kids aren't more valuable, like that special value uh, that would make my kids, uh, my kids special objectively, not just in the eyes of my parents, uh, not just in the eyes of, of, of the parents, like that, that value doesn't really, doesn't really exist, right? Uh, they are valuable as human beings, but not as uh, Ismail's children, for example, or Mary's children, or whatever. Uh, so I value my kids as a parent, but it doesn't mean that my kids in themselves are valuable in any other ways that any other human being is valuable. Like, I can also value the watch that my grandfather left me, but it's not more valuable than any other watch in that regard. 
Quote, claiming that something is valuable involves claiming that its attributes uh, merit, be uh, merit being valued generally and valuing one's own children above others in the sense in which uh, we, we all do this lacks this impersonal quality and this dependence on what is merited or uh, called for by their attributes. So, Scanlon is going to focus on what, uh, what it means for something to be valuable rather than valuing in this chapter. Because when we value something, it often comes with the belief that there is something valuable about the thing we value. And also because valuing something that is not valuable doesn't uh, at all undermine our reasons for valuing it. Like, whether something is valuable or not doesn't tell me if I have to value uh, my grandpa's watch or not. So, we saw this with friendship and science. Just as uh, just to say that these things are valuable isn't enough to give reasons to value them either. And it doesn't even follow that from the existence of, or occurrence of those things, we should value them. Uh, as we've seen, we need other judgments to constitute reasons. So, to recapitulate Scanlon's point so far about value, it has two distinct ideas. One is the idea emphasized in the preceding section, that value is not purely a tele teleological notion. The other is the claim that being valuable is not a property that provides us with reasons. Rather, to call something valuable is to say that it has other properties that provide reasons for behaving in certain ways with regard to it. So, this is what we mean by it has the potential for value. Even though Scanlon doesn't really use, uh, use that phrase, it means that a thing has properties that we then use as basis for our reasons. Something doesn't have the property of good or the property of value, rather it has properties that we can value, meaning, that, meaning properties that give reasons to certain people in certain contexts to behave favorably towards uh, those things. And so this is kind of related to uh, G. E. Moore's uh, open question argument that we already discussed. Remember, things have natural properties, like they are pleasant, for example, or they provide new knowledge on, uh, on how to cure cancer, etc. And these can be the base for valuing those things. But as Moore says, but being good or valuable cannot be identified with any such natural property or more generally with any non-normative property. Uh, this is the lesson of the open question argument. So when I say that X is pleasant, uh, but do I mean that it is good? It is uh, an always open question because according to this view, we can never conclude that X is valuable based on its natural properties like pleasant or it cures cancer. It doesn't, uh, he doesn't say that uh, it isn't valuable, he says that G.E. Uh, Moore, uh, we're talking about G.E. Moore, G.E. Moore doesn't say that it is not valuable, he says that you cannot draw the conclusion that it is from those properties. So the reason for, the reason for that is because natural properties are not practical but metaphysical, whereas value is a practical property, which means that it depends on the context in which it is brought. So therefore, conclusions uh, would always change since contexts always change as well. Uh, conclusions about you know, whether something is valuable or not. So in other words, there cannot be a definite answer to the question, is X good? So don't confuse this with relativism, and uh, we will get to relativism in due time, but a glimpse of the answer is uh, the following. Scanlon asserts that even if being valuable cannot be identified with having any set of natural properties, it remains true that a things having these properties can be grounds for concluding that it is valuable. So in other words, we may be unable to identify value in natural properties, but that doesn't mean that natural properties cannot be grounds for concluding that something is valuable. We can arrive at those conclusions in two ways. We can either try to locate the property valuable in the objects themselves and argue that those are non-natural properties, which is what uh, G.E. Moore does, or because that solution opens a can of worms that we don't want to open, there's the other way, which is the alternative that Scanlon prefers. Um, this is what he calls the buck passing account, which is, quote, the alternative, which I believe to be correct, is to hold that being good or valuable is not a property that itself provides a reason to respond to a thing in certain ways. Rather, to be good or valuable is to have other properties that constitute such reasons. 
So here, uh, Scanlon refers to John Rawls theory of goodness, which say that when you say that something is considered good, uh, when, that, when that thing has the property that we would rationally want it to have, like uh, Rasen, who is uh, my best friend, uh, shout out, uh, is, a, is a good friend because he has the properties that anyone would rationally want in a friend to have. So Rasen doesn't have the property good, but the properties that a friend should have. Like, uh, likewise, we can say that uh, that value is like a placeholder, to use the term uh, of the philosopher Shelley, Shelley Keegan. A placeholder is a linguistic term that doesn't have a semantic meaning, but is used for stylistic purposes. Like, it is a shame that he lost the game. The it doesn't refer to uh, the actual subject, which is that he lost the game. Um, so normally that sentence would be that he lost the game is a shame. So it is a placeholder, you know? And so values work kind of in the, in, in the same way. Racine is a good friend means that Racine has the properties of a friend we rationally want in a friend. So good is a placeholder for properties of a friend we rationally want. Like it is a placeholder uh, for that he lost the game. So here we can say too that value and goodness are non-natural properties, like in Moore's case, but the difference is that unlike Moore's alternative, which states that it is those non-natural properties that give me reason to adopt a positive attitude towards those things, like I have reasons to value uh, friendship because of the non-natural uh, property valuable in friendship. Scanlon's alternative argues that it is the other natural properties that provide reasons to adopt those uh, attitudes. So how, does the, uh, how do those properties provide reasons? Well, here uh, there are two uh, ways to support the buck passing account. Both of these ways are grounded in our intuitions when we come to value things, like what supports those reasons from, uh, from properties is our intuition that these things are valuable. The first way is by claiming that intuitively the natural properties make something valuable. Like when I say that a plant has some chemicals that can cure cancer, it simply becomes valuable. Like it seems obvious that the plant is valuable. Or if I know that a place is beautiful to camp at, that's intuitively obvious that it's a good reason to visit that place or to recommend it to my friends. And so there is the second way. Uh, the second way is by appealing to a variety of modes of justifying accounts. Like we can, um, like we, we make uh, an account about the things, properties that would, uh, the, the things, properties that would make it good, uh, good ground for having reasons to value it, to make those natural properties, uh, reason giving properties. Like I can describe something to you and by doing so you come to see its properties as uh, as you know reasons to value it. I can spend for example hours telling you about Van Gogh's Starry Nights and my account uh, of it would make you see the painting in a new light that you would consider it valuable, right? So this of course doesn't mean that I make the thing desirable since um, since uh, we already discussed the issue of desires, but make it sound that it is rational for that thing to have the properties that I'm describing, like it makes sense. And by that, I have showed you the potential of that painting to be valuable to you. Like my best friend, uh, my best friend, Racine, for example, doesn't value philosophy like I do, but it is possible that either through me or others, he comes to see it, uh, he comes to see it as I do. And so he'll have reasons to finish the myth of Sisyphus by Camus and enjoy the, the shit out of it. <laughs> and this account can also serve as a ground for teleological values as well. But again, Scanlon isn't dis uh, discrediting teleological accounts of values, but he is saying that these aren't the only ones you can have, and there are other accounts that would fit more uh, with how we value things on a regular basis. So in this regard, Scanlon is rejecting the claim that there can be a systematic theory of value, like a one, unifi a one unifying theory that can account for all the different ways we form reasons for valuing things. Um, people will always value different things and in different ways for different reasons in different contexts and there cannot be one theory that would account for all 
of that diversity about value. Like there is no manual that would tell you what things are valuable or how much valuable they are. And so in the terms of Scanlon, understanding the value of something is not just a matter of knowing how valuable it is, but rather a matter of knowing how to value it, knowing what kinds of actions and attitudes are called for. And so this is a good time to remember uh, The Good Place, uh, that show which is based on Scanlon's uh, book. Uh, in it, you have Chidi, uh, the moral philosophy professor. Uh, he died because of his indecisiveness, uh, his indecisive nature, precisely because he never knows what to value. Everything seems valuable to him. Uh, whenever he tries to make a choice, well, he can't, uh, he, can't, he can't make a choice because he always thinks of all the reasons in favor of both choices. And that is to be contrasted with the fact that he spent all his adult life trying to finish his thesis about value and, spoiler alert, he never finishes it because he was trying to come up with a systematic theory of value instead of just, you know, pick up, you know, <laughs> pick up the, the board, just pick up, I don't know, the board eraser or, or anything. Instead of, you know, learning how to value each thing, he sees that they are all valuable. And so Scanlon gives the example of art. In the example of music, if, um, like for example, it is true uh, that how valuable something is can count. After all, that's how museums work for paintings and how acad uh, academy awards ceremonies are supposed to work. Like considering something valuable, even in a teleological sense, like it's to be promoted and how much we want it, uh, it's, occur it's occurring. It all plays a big role and people would disagree about a lot in these instances. But people can also disagree about how to value these things. And this might be more relevant to our discussion of values uh, that how, that how uh, valuable things, uh, things are. These are about attitudes with which one should approach it. It is to be savored or contemplated in a serious and concentrated way, or taken more light-heartedly, uh, light even casually, as something da diverting and amusing. So in short, Skellen is a pluralist when it comes to value, and so um, there can't be uh, one single overage, uh, overaching, overarching sorry, value to which all other values must abide. So here Scanlon follows the philosopher Elizabeth Anscomb, uh, sorry, Elizabeth Anderson, uh, who is who is his main inspiration about pluralism, but he does disagree with her on a few points uh, in a footnote about her expressive uh, theory of rational action. For her, uh, to value something means that you express that you value that thing by displaying a certain attitude in its favor, but uh, that way of treating it must be in accord with the norms of expressing your attitude of valuing. Like if I value something at protect, it from, uh, protect it from harm, I express that I value my girlfriend, for example, by protecting her from harm or by not cheating, etc. If I fail to do so, then it means that I don't value that thing. So this means that there is a certain way to value the things that we, that we value, and that's what matters in pluralism, that there are many ways of expressing value through our attitudes. And so Skellen agrees with this, but disagrees that reasons can only arise when the way you treat something is according to the norm of expression. Like, Anderson seems to say that because I don't harm or cheat on my girlfriend, which is in accord with the norms of how to value my girlfriend, then I have a reason to value my girlfriend. Scanlon says it's because I have reasons to value my girlfriend that I don't cheat on her. Like the case, uh, like the case of the friend, friendship comes with loyalty, and so I, if I value my friend, I have reasons for valuing my, uh, my loyalty then I have to express that by being, you know, committed to the things that come with friendship. So pluralism is more highlighted in the case of how to value things than in what's valuable, because the latter will always tend more towards a unifying account of value, like towards a monist account, where there, you know, just uh, one supreme value, you know, the good. Whereas when it comes to how we value, when it comes to our attitudes, then pluralism is more plausible there. It doesn't mean that those attitudes are completely subjective and can be appropriate to the, to the thing itself. The disagreement about attitudes that we have towards the things we value or disvalue uh, isn't really about having the right uh, 
the right moods to have uh, to have an experience for example suppose you get into an elevator and in there there is uh, they're, they're, they're playing some Beethoven music uh, and so this is an example that uh, Scanlon uses uh, someone is enjoying the music while uh, you are not and we can say that there is a disagreement between uh, between you two and the disagreement is about the moods like which mood should you have in order to induce the, uh, exper the experience of listening to Beethoven in an elevator. But Scanlon says that the disagreement is not about the mood to have the right experience, but rather the disagreement is about the experience itself. You think that the people who are playing Beethoven in the elevator and the guy vibing to it uh, don't understand the value of Beethoven. Like Beethoven shouldn't be played in an elevator. It should be placed in either the operas or in epic movies or something, you know. So our attitudes towards the things we value require that belief, uh, that, that, be, uh, that, that we believe that there is an appropriate way to express the things that we value. And we can disagree whether or not we are expressing our attitudes in the appropriate way in regard to the things we value. And so as Scanlon ends this section with, understanding the value of something often involves not merely knowing that it is valuable or how valuable it is, but also how it is to be valued. So we can disagree on how to value Beethoven or our friends or partners, uh, but these disagreements ought to be, uh, ought to be based on reasons uh, that are well reasonable. But it can be objected since this is all grounded on intuition, that an appeal to intuition isn't satisfactory and can uh, come off as fallacious and arbitrary. So we often take intuition, uh, like outside of philosophy, to be unreliable for the assessment of things we consider rational. Uh, as he says, this objection of uh, to into, into intuitionism holds that judgment about value involves appeals to diverse intuitions about what is fitting or appropriate. So the problem is that an appeal to intuition seems to be contrary to the rationality when it comes to assessing uh, if our reasons about value are fitting or appropriate and seems that anything would go as uh, as you throw as you throw in it's by intuition like uh, like appeals to intuition uh, seems to be a limit of thinking, uh, being unable to justify why we value certain things or our reasons for valuing those things, we throw in, well, it's by intuition. And so in this regard, teleological accounts would avoid this problem since they pretend to be able to give reasons and justifications without the appeal to intuition. Uh, in a note there, Scanlon mentions uh, again Philippe Petit's criticism of non-consequentialists, account uh, such as Scanlon's, as seriously defective in regard to the methodology, uh, to the method methodological virtue of simplicity. So what he means is that consequentialism has the virtue of simplicity in the sense that it can achieve uh, similar results that non-consequentialism. Uh, can't without complicating, you know, the matter or adding more requirements that are less reliable uh, than just, you know, quantifying pleasure or well-being, for example. But Scanlon has uh, two, uh, two answers to this objection. First, he says that intuition is based on a methodology. We come to intuitively make judgments based on a way of thinking about things. So intuition isn't the opposite of thought, but rather a way of thinking that has been mastered by the mind. When you start, do, when you start do mathematics, for example, you start doing it for the first time. Answers don't seem intuitive because you're still struggling with the method. With the method, but as you keep exercising, eventually it will become easier, and the time you need to solve a mathematical problem gets shorter and shorter until the solution to the problem would just appear right away and just appear quickly. You can solve problems intuitively. So since our intuitions are based on a method for thinking, Scanlon says that all we have to do is to make sure that our intuition is the result of the right method for assessing reasons. So when we have an intuition about reasons, ask yourself if that intuition fits the method Scanlon gave in the first chapter and that we have already covered. The second response is more a substantive one 
Like, sure, uh, intuitions aren't reliable in assessing which properties or reasons uh, are relevant in the case of value. Determining appropriateness on the basis of intuition isn't going to guard us against possible fuck-ups and can, as Petit uh, says, overlook the simplicity of consequentialism. But then Scanlon asks, so what? Like, it may be true that Scanlon's account overlooks simplicity or violates uh, Occam's razor, uh, the rule that, that says when you have two theories that get the same result, you have to choose the simplest one. But Scanlon uh, denies that consequentialism and non-consequentialism are equal in that regard, because as we've seen, the simplicity of consequentialism can also overlook many valid reasons we can come up with to value things. He writes, but consequentialism and non-consequentialism are not equally satisfactory if, as I have argued, the former involves giving up claims about value that are at least as plausible as the ones that it retains. So, in Petit's account, he claims that to value something means to promote it and honor it. Honoring it means uh, seeing it as Scanlon sees value. But Petit argues that uh, also to honor something is to promote it, like these two are not separate from each other. Whereas Scanlon argues that promoting something is a way of honoring it like you can honor something without promoting it. So to uh, the, the, uh, the account of Scanlon is indeed more complex than petite simplicity, but it regards more things to be relevant for formulating our reasons for value than the narrow criterion of you have to promote, uh, to promote uh, the thing. So as Cannon says again, it would be a mistake to ignore judgment that, uh, that we in, fi uh, in fact take to be relevant just for the sake of a greater neatness in our thinking or, in gra or for greater simplicity. So we can see this in the two uh, in the two ways of how intuition works, that an account of intuition may be more complex than simple consequentialism, but it opens more space for different reasons. It is more inclusive. So the simplicity of consequentialism and teleological accounts in general can be, can be deeply appealing. It, uh, uh, I mean, in the next uh, section, Scanlon examines more why is that, and it has something to do with, well, pleasure, uh, hedonism. Uh, it seems to be always looming on teleological accounts. Uh, hedonism is the idea that what matters in life is pleasure and the pain is to be avoided. And so teleological account is deeply appealing because it's either always related to uh, the simple hedonism or maintains a hedonistic structure even after hedonism is abandoned. A hedonistic uh, structure is the following. States of affairs would be uh, the bearers of value. They would be more or less valuable depending on the amount of pleasure and pain they contained, and the reason generally uh, generated by value would all be uh, of the same uh, simple form. Reasons to bring about the most valuable states of affairs. So, when hedonism is abandoned, you just replace pleasure and pain by other things, but the structure remains the same. So we value something when the occurrence of its states of affairs is to be promoted or sought after. So consequentialism doesn't state, for example, that the relevant uh, consequences to uh, assess the value of an action are measured in terms of pleasure and pain. That would be utilitarianism, a form of consequentialism that says that the good is the best pleasure for the majority of people, but rather consequentialism just leaves open the question of what counts as the good. But whatever the good may be, it has to be in a consequ consequentialist framework, a state of affairs to be promoted and maximized. Hence, it keeps this hedonistic uh, structure. If not pleasure, then we can replace it with well-being, for example, which has its own chapter. It can be, you know, life as opposed uh, to death, etc. And so all of these things, Scanlon argues, uh, life, death, pain, pleasure, uh, none of them can account for, uh, for the other things we value in life. Like, we cannot say that everything is either um, pleasure or either pleasant or painful, or we can say that everything we value has to be valued in relation to death or life. Uh, so they neither exhaust the range of, of values and this value we have, nor they can uh, be uh, representative of all our values and this value. So, not only that, they're also incapable of giving a full account by themselves on themselves. Like, 
like if you take death by itself by isolation you can't really assess why death would be a disvalue we can only answer that by placing death in a context and that context is that we are alive so in this sense we won't be able to disvalue death if we don't also value life so the disvalue of death is a positive aspect of the value of life so here Scanlon kind of refers, uh, refers to questions of how to value death, which can be answered from a teleological perspective, since tele uh, teleological accounts take it for granted that death or pain are bad in themselves. Like you value life and pleasure because they are valuable and hence they, are, and hence they don't address how to value uh, those things besides through maximization, which follows from the intrinsic value of things, uh, of those things, sorry. But that leaves aside the following question. How should our thinking about the value of life be affected by the fact that it is finite? What attitude should we have towards this fact? Fear? Resignation? How should we take account of the possibility of death in deciding how to live? So, these questions are kind of left out, according to Scanlon, because they are not teleological. They are not about goals. Teleological, uh, teleological accounts, uh, maximization, etc. take things to be valued as simply goals. My goal is to live as long as possible and avoid or postpone death as much as I can. But that leaves, uh, leaves out questions about when and in what way should I value those goals. When, uh, where, and how should I do the uh, ceteris uh, paribus thingy? So these are matters of attitudes toward those things and towards others because it's through my relationships with my father, mother, children, friends, relatives, uh, partners, colleagues, employer, employees, etc. that I will come to adopt those attitudes towards my goals, towards life, towards death, towards pleasure and pain. So the judgment that something is good in a teleological sense would rely on prior judgments about my attitudes. Quote, the judgment that an instance of uh, one of these pleasures is good, that a state of affairs involving, uh, involving it is to be promoted, thus depends on prior judgments about the appropriateness of the behavior and attitudes towards others that it involves. So our values are part of a larger framework that is broader and more complex than teleological accounts. And so we therefore arrive at the last section of the chapter, and it's about the biggest question so far. How are we to value human life? Like from a teleological perspective, what is great about human life is that its occurrence is good and so human life should be promoted. And a world in which human life exists is better than a world in which it doesn't. This, of course, is debatable, but you get the point. When we talk about the value of human life, we mean that we appreciate that value, like we have reasons to adopt a positive, a positive attitude towards human life. And so these attitudes can be expressed through respect, uh, protecting, preserving human life. But as Kellen points, these aren't necessarily attitudes of, of a tele teleological nature, because these don't necessarily hold that we have to promote human life in order to value it. For example, when we look at antinatalist uh, philosophy, which is the idea that bringing a human uh, being into the world is unethical because life when is full of, su full of suffering, we can see that someone may value human life in the sense of uh, not uh, in the sense of not destroying it, but that someone can also have reasons not to create more human life. So our attitudes towards life depend on a lot of things prior to those attitudes. In other words. Reasons to preserve life, not to destroy it, and reasons to create life are different. And as Kellen argues, the latter is way weaker than the former. When you compare which reasons you uh, uh, we have, uh, like which which reasons have more weight, the reasons not to destroy human life seem more categorical than reasons to bring in a human life. Indeed, someone who doesn't want to have kids or create life is seen as making a personal choice, like it's up to them whether or not they want to have kids, but someone who wants to destroy life, wants to kill human beings, that's different. So Scanlon argues that while it may be considered good that human life exists, 
the central value lies in the reasons to protect and preserve it rather than simply having more of it. And so he emphasizes that the reasons to protect and preserve human life do not necessarily imply a blanket endorsement of creating more human life. As he says, appreciating the value of human life is primarily a matter of seeing human lives as something to be respected, where, uh, this, uh, uh, where this involves seeing reasons not to destroy them, reasons to protect them, and reasons to want them to go well. But Skellen goes even further, uh, saying that this notion of respect uh, for human life can't be about human life in general like in the abstract sense but it's always about respecting human lives in their particularities like appreciating the value of human life involves respecting individuals in their well-being with a focus on the person's life rather than an abstract notion of human life as a whole so this distinction becomes particularly important in cases of uh, euthanasia or suicide uh, Scanlon asks when you have someone in a deep coma, is it wrong to take them out of life support? Would it mean that you don't value life if you do that? Or what about suicide? Is it wrong for someone who is in unbearable pain to end their own life? And so Scanlon argues, no, the value of human life doesn't provide systematic reasons to promote it or create and maintain it that would overrule all other reasons. So sure, there are cases in which the value of human life is a powerful um, ground for good reasons that can't be objected to, like in the case of murder or, uh, or of a cynical suicide. Think of someone who kills themselves because they fail to see that nothing is worth uh, living. Uh, because they felt to see that nothing is worth living is, a, is, is, a, is false or because they were rejected by a lover. Uh, that they are in pain is understandable, but that they take uh, this pain for a reason to kill themselves proves that they failed at understanding or seeing that the value of life overrides you know, those, those reasons. So the same can be said about people who, uh, who, though, who though stay alive are completely idle or are living through cynical nihilism. These people along with the suicidal type we mentioned uh, because again not everyone who is suicidal fails to see these reasons so these people uh, have in uh, Scanlon's words a failure to see the reasons they have to go on living uh, reasons provided for example by their possible accomplishments by the good they might uh, do for others and by the pleasures they could attain so from this we can derive that when we say that someone uh, values their life uh, it means that someone sees understands accepts and is moved by the reasons to go on living or as Scanlon puts it this suggests that while appreciating the value of human life involves seeing that there are strong reasons for protecting life and for not destroying it these reasons are restricted by the qualification as long as the person whose life it is has reason to go on living or wants to live. We might say then that recognizing the value of human life is a matter of respecting each human being as a locus of reasons. That is to say, recognizing the force of their reasons for wanting to live and wanting their lives to go better. But still, this is a problem. Uh, actually, two problems that uh, Scanlon points at. The first is that it brings us back to the issue of the ideal observer that Nigel talked about, and we've seen that uh, in the first chapter. Like, it seems to suggest that there is an objective way to determine whether someone's life is worth living or not, if we take into account all of the relevant reasons in someone's life. Like, we think that there can be an impartial observer that can be like giving all the reasons uh, Robin Williams has at, uh, at his disposal. We can confirm that killing himself was objectively, uh, was objectively, uh, objectively, sorry, reasonable. Uh, so this would require the ability to be able to assess and see all the reasons available to us simultaneously, which of course is impossible. So no one can be obje objective to that extent. And as Scanner writes in, uh, in a note, it would be asking too much to claim that each person has reason to be concerned with every end another person has, an interpretation that remains at the level of reasons and values uh, and value does uh, and does not uh, invoke the limits on our own obligations to others. And then there is the second problem, 
uh, is that uh, the view which uh, the view just described simply states that we are creatures with reasons like that's it uh, we have reasons to do stuff but that doesn't tell us how to assess those reasons how to select them which ones uh, to select etc and it doesn't even tell us if we have those capacities like the capacities to select uh, but appreciating and being aware of those capacities is also what makes life worth living like literally because it's those capacities that well allow me to appreciate life so what these two problems suggests uh what these two problems uh, suggest sorry one uh, one says that we cannot be impartial and the other says that we have to appreciate our capacities for assessing reasons when we take these two problems together, we arrive at the following view. Quote, we must select uh, among these reasons, and we should do this in a way that recognizes the capacity of human beings as rational creatures to assess reasons and to govern their lives according to this assessment. In my view, the best uh, response to these uh, two considerations is this. Respecting the value of human rational life requires us to treat rational creatures only in ways that would be allowed by principles that they could not reasonably reject, insofar as they too were seeking principles of mutual governance which other rational creatures could not reasonably reject. So, in other words, we have to appreciate and recognize that we are reason assessing self-governing creatures and therefore within our limits we have to be who we are those creatures that can provide reasons for what we value which is the grounds for self-governing and we should treat others as such so when it comes to morality to right or wrong Scanlon says that it is based on how we value human life and we value it through the appreciation in ourselves and in others of those characteristics that we just mentioned that we are self-governing and reason assessing creatures and therefore we owe respect for others because of those uh, same characteristics so whenever i do something i have to do it on the grounds that i can provide reasons for others to accept those reasons so this would reconcile the famous quarrel between rights and duties which are often seen at seen at odds with with each other and that teleological accounts try to reconcile with a with a simplistic uh, form of value like when my rights for property uh, clash with duties toward others for example teleological accounts would try to solve the problem by asking which state of affairs is to be promoted uh, but here however what matters is our reasons for owning property that would clash with our duties and so in our uh, in our if, if if sorry if our reasons are rejectable then case closed so we can agree with Scanlon when he says looking back it seems to me that this is what one should expect the idea of valuing human life and the idea of respecting one's duty and other people's right are to be closely related if not the very same thing hence we see that to be valuable isn't just to be promoted it can be argued uh, it can be argued that way, but values have a more complex structure than uh, that, sorry, that uh, Scanlon's account uh, of what we owe to each other uh, captures best uh, than the simple uh, structures of theological accounts. And that's it for this second chapter. Uh, Next week we will uh, cover the third chapter of what we owe to each other, which will be about the, uh, the notion of well-being. And so thank you for, uh, for watching. And